Welcome to an introduction to process mapping using BPMN shapes. Today we're going to introduce the basic shapes of BPMN and how to use them for those that have some experience with process mapping or reviewed other videos on the topic. We're going to be looking at basic processing mapping shapes like pools, lanes, tasks, exclusive gateways, start and end events, and we're actually going to go through creating our first process map. BPMN stands for Business Process Modeling Notation. It's a standard set of shapes that are used to illustrate process maps. This standard is actually maintained by a body called the Object Management Group. If you're interested in reading more, visit omg.org. So why would anybody use BPMN? Well, BPMN is like a language, whether it be spoken or programmed. It ensures that there's this consistent communication between those that are reviewing a process map and those who write it. So other people can understand what you're trying to communicate with your process map. The first shape we're going to look at is the pool, and this is really your most fundamental element. It acts as a container for a single process. Pools, however, can contain multiple lanes within them, but we'll take a look at that in just a moment. What's important to remember from a pool is that this is your container, and within your pool you're going to be actually having your process mapped out. As mentioned, a pool can have lanes within it. What a lane is is a dividing line within that pool, so it further divides it up for us. And the tasks that appear within that lane are owned either by that specific role or department. Although in our example we only have two lanes, you could have several lanes within a pool. Now let's take a look at our first shape that appears within the flow of a process map. It's simply called a task. This is the most commonly used shape, and your process maps will most likely have several of these throughout it. It defines an activity or a piece of work that needs to be completed. When defining your tasks, you're always going to want to start it off with an action word, like conduct, determine, or review. Now let's look at our second most commonly used shape, the exclusive gateway. This is sometimes just called a decision box, or simply a gateway. What it does is it creates a condition for us where a choice needs to be made. Imagine if you're driving a car and you pull up into an intersection, and your choices are to go left, right, or straight. You'd have to make one choice, and you could only go down one path. That's what our exclusive gateway does, is it creates those conditions for us and it becomes exclusive in the nature that you can only make one choice and then follow that path. A start event is just that. It indicates the start of our process map. While there are many different types of start events, we're only going to be looking at the most basic one, and that's a circle with a very thin border around it. I've also included the variation here where the circle is green, as many of the process mapping tools that are actually used to create process maps will by default set your start shape to a green color. Similar to the start event, the end event also has many different types of ends. However, for today we're only going to be looking at the most basic shape. What you can see is that similar to the start event, it is a circle, however the border that goes around the circle is much more thick now. I've also included the variation of red for our end event, as some of those process mapping tools will also default this color to red. It's time for the fun to begin. Let's get started with creating our first process map. To get started, I'm going to want to understand what is the process I want to map out. For today, let's take a look at paying for a chocolate bar in a store with a cashier. What I can tell too already is that when I start to look at my level 2 eventually, I'll know that there's at least two interaction points here. One between the customer that's paying for that chocolate bar, as well as the cashier. The second question, which is fundamental for every process map as well, is knowing my boundaries. What is my start and my end point? For today, let's say that our start is when the cashier asks for the payment, and the end is when the cashier says thank you. Looking at our level 1, we can confirm that this is a high level description. We can see that there's a total of 5 shapes and only 3 tasks within it. What's important is that our level 1 is going to be setting the stage to say what exactly is that process at an extremely high level point of view. It's about bringing your stakeholders together and getting agreement as to what the process is. There is no set guideline as to how many shapes should be included, however I encourage you to keep it under 7 shapes. Let's take a look at our process. We can see that our start shape lines up to the bound that we set up in the previous slide. Our cashier requests the payment, which is going to be kicking off our process. Our first task is going to be deciding that payment method, followed by processing the payment, and then deciding the receipt method, finally to our end event where the payment method is completed. You may ask the question of, there's so many other details, why haven't we included them? Again, what we want to try to do is conceptualize what does that process look like at a very high level. If you feel you have a good idea of what the process is, I would say we've done a very successful job at communicating our level one. 
Now let's look at our level two. This is our interaction process map. And we can already tell that there are two swim lanes as well as several other task fields included. We can see that our pool has two swim lanes, our cashier and our customer. And these are going to be two interaction points for paying for our chocolate bar. The cashier starts our process by requesting a payment. As we start to follow the process, we can see that the first task is underneath the customer's swim lane, meaning that they own it, and that's determining our payment method. We can see that the exclusive gateway has created that fork in the road, where the customer can only choose either debit, so through a banking card, or an NFC device, such as Android or Apple Pay. As we follow our process from the exclusive gateway, following the debit path, we can see the next task is handing the card to the cashier. The customer has now handed the card to the cashier, and we can see the next two tasks fall underneath the cashier's swim lane. That's inserting the chip card into the reader and then handing that card reader back to the customer. When we start to follow our process further, we can see that the next two tasks then fall back on the customer to authorize the payment on the card reader and then return the card reader back to the cashier. With our final task being the cashier thanking our customer and then our transaction is complete. As you can tell, our level two was still quite high level, although it did add a little bit more detail. And that was intentional for today. However, as you're mapping your level two out, you might decide to include additional detail. So for example, underneath that authorize the payment on the card reader, we could have added in some conditions where if the customer had insufficient funds or entered in the incorrect pin, there may have been other paths to follow as well. What's important to keep in mind is that your process map should always speak to your audience. And you're gonna to wanna to be able to actually put together a level of detail that meets their needs. There are a few items that I did want to highlight in case I didn't make them explicit through today's session. And that's using the colors red and green. Red to indicate your end event and then green to indicate your start event. You're going to want to try to use these colors to grab the attention of the reviewer. This helps set the stage immediately to know where are my start and end point of the process maps by using these colors. You may have noticed that our level 2 process map flows down and to the right. This wasn't by coincidence. It is best practice when possible to have your process maps flow down and to the right. Also, I encourage you not to be afraid to extend your process beyond one screen or page. Don't feel limited to a specific container when you're mapping out your process. The reason why is because as you start to try to condense those process shapes together, it becomes more challenging to actually follow your process and know the outcomes of your steps. And we're done. That concludes the session. Hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to leave them in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks so much.